And yes, we are counting down to the announcement of the decision of MPC tomorrow. Meanwhile, uh, we are supposed to be in meeting him as we speak. So let's start our meeting concerning the F MPC. That's a monetary policy committee meeting for July. You know, it's once in two months. And, and see what they should be discussing at this time as we have our own discussion now and joining us. Follow up on that conversation by Professor Waleke is Mr. Gospel Lobeli. Uh, he's a chief economist with uh, Streetnomics and joins us from the United Kingdom. Uh, Mr. Obeli, thank you so much for your time this morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Great to be here today. Good to have you. So um, you had Professor Waleke there. Of course, the issue of CRR, which was reduced for the Merchant Bank, uh, of course, is also dominating conversations around the MPC meeting. And we cannot run away from inflation at 22.7%. Uh, Obviously, that is number one. Uh, and we know that at the last meeting, um, the now embattled uh, governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria had defended uh, the rate hike, saying that if there was no rate hike, that things would have been worse than it is now. Do you expect the MPC to continue its rate hike in this meeting they're having now. Thank you so much um, for having me once again. I think there are lots of cards on the table to play out. Um, the inflation construct right now that we deal with is no longer just monetary, you know, in sense. You know, you have lots of factors contributing to the current inflationary state of an Nigerian economy beyond just monetary economics, money supply and all that. Um, you have the fact that um, in the last one year, um, the pre-elections, the false scarcity, the wrong um, poor management of the Naira, and also the uncertainties around the outcome of the elections and the new government coming in, the roller coaster of policies that's happened in recent times have put the economy at a level of cost of living um, where you have some more pressure in and you have a situation where people are spending more of their incomes just trying to get through all the basic necessities they need to get a life on a daily basis. So meaning that inflation is no longer just a monetary phenomenon, but how we manage that economy has penetrated deeply into the cost fabric of the economy right now. So on one end, we're dealing with infl an inflationary crisis. On the other end, we're dealing with a cost of living crisis, as it were. And in my own opinion, I do not think that interest rates are enough in the context of dealing with an inflationary construct that is non-monetary in itself or not completely monetary in itself, all right? So you're also thinking about the, the downside of Russian Ukraine for Ukraine war, climate change, and all of those important inflationary impacts on the Nigerian economy. So if you look at it, you know, holistically, you understand that there are different mini moving parts that are feeding into the inflationary numbers as such. And as much as interest rates is a necessary condition to deal, it is not sufficient in context to what two mix are required to bring down inflation. All right. So, however, um, best conventional case is to use interest rate, which is where the world is, you know, is at today. And um, in my own simple opinion, I think at the very best case and hopeful case of things would be for the central bank to retain rates. But um, moving with the bandwagon will be that rates may be increased at least maybe by 5%, 7% window. Mm, I guess the bandwagon is no longer moving because we saw South Africa just last week, they did retain rates, you know, yeah. and uh, we're hearing the Fed Reserve also talking about halting its rate hikes. I don't know if it'll be for this meeting or for the next one. So uh, I guess at this point, and, you know, there's also the factor that uh, this will be the first time that the MPs will be meeting without uh, the embattled uh, governor, uh, Godwin Emefiele, yeah. in nine years. So uh, maybe that will also add a little bit of trick. And we've, we've uh, I don't know if to call it the president's uh, body language, where he has said that he expects or he would prefer to work with a single digit interest rate, even though that seems very far away. So when you put all this <laughs> together, perhaps the NPC the would decide to halt the movement for a bit, you think? <laughs> yeah, that's, so that's why I said the best case scenario would be to hold because of all these factors you mentioned. Um, clearly, there were strong um, beyond monetary factors that were influencing the state of the interest. Um, South Africa has its own nuance to deal and, um, you know, choose, in terms of choosing to finally hold on the interest rates. And you also want to look at 
possibilities of Afri other African countries may be following suit. And the reason why it's important is because we need that economy space to breathe in context of the rural coastal policy that's currently happening. We want to also be able to see the impact of the current or the new administration policies and what it hopes to do you know, in the context of the real economy and the financial markets and all of that going forward. And so it's just best you hold rates so that you can literally allow the economy to pace through these policy changes and these trying times, you know, to layer on on that, thinking of the first subsidy and all that. So, um, and, and again, I mean, it's the first time in a long time we've had a very decisive president, quote and unquote. And uh, we're also trying to look at how that body language, like you mentioned, will impact on the conversa conversations today and the final outcome tomorrow morning. Although, within the context of, context of things, I would not still be ultimately surprised if there's, if there's, there's to be an increase. If at all there's going to be an increase, it's going to be a very little, maybe not so significant increase, but it's tilting more like a perception to hold than to increase. Because like I mentioned, there are too many cards on the table and increasing will further, you know, sort of push the economy on the edge a bit more and may, count, may be counterintuitive to what the new president hopes to achieve, you know, on the many grounds of the policies he's planning to run with. Mm. There's also another factor that uh, surfaced last week. We had the number that a currency in circulation increased by 9 trillion naira in one month, May to June. That's also another threat to, you know, yeah. hyperinflation. Yeah. I've been asking, I've been trying to understand, I don't, I don't know if you can help me, where the money just flowed in from. Is it from the politicians? Where, where did 9 trillion naira come out from yeah. in, in, in a mean, month? It's... it's... It's very easy um, economic math, you know, let me so to say, because the reason why you have higher money in circulation right now is because people are spending more, all right? People are spending more, not necessarily because they're earning more, but because the cost of having a life is also increasing. So technically, if you need, let's say, for instance, now Nigeria is still a very cash-driven economy. So if you need 750 Naira to buy a... a to buy bread, for instance, right now you're spending close to 1K, 1.5, one seven, as the case may be, based on where you live as well, in cash to buy. So you have more monies in cash in circulation, not necessarily because politicians are spending more, but generally because the whole economy in context is spending more as a result of rising cost of living, rising cost of doing business. So, and that's a bit of a very, very interesting dynamic to watch because uh, when you think of the fact that the first subsidy is in quote gone and um, the perception of a unified exchange rate and all of these economics, then you can boldly say that that would also have a cost push impact on the economy. And a cost push would technically mean people will spend more. But the problem with this nature of increased spending is that it doesn't come with increased income or increased standard of living or quote unquote a better life. So it's sort of taking more from the people than it's enabling. So what you have is that inflation reveals that there is an increasing poverty trap. Poverty trap because the, the bar to have a basic to have your basic necessities met on a daily basis is rising. All right. If you do not have a certain amount of income, a certain amount of disposables, you cannot have a quality of life at a certain level. So it's costing more. And it's um, leading to rising expense in terms of exchange of Naira in, in, in terms of uh, in the real economy for people to have a life and to, to just live life on a daily basis. And when you factor that into the overall scheme of things, it's likely very unhealthy for the economy. And you now find out that the same thing you're trying to use interest rates to fight, you know, is <laughs> looking as though your, your efforts are, are not yielding much, which is why I started off by saying that the inflation we're dealing with right now and the rising money in supply is not necessarily because of monetary factors, but largely because of strong policy dynamics that have been largely incoherent and they are eating deeply into the, the disposable spend of the average Nigerian, which is also very worrisome, by the way. Mm. So obviously, from what you're saying, uh, MPC meeting, rate hike or no rate hike, will not necessarily solve the problem uh, that yeah, the country... They may not be, yes, there may not be a fundamental change in the grand scheme of things, because I mean, for, for vulnerable economies, it takes a longer time for the impact of policy incoherence to sort of fizzle out. But are we on the like, right track? Are we on the right track, Mr. Billy? When we see, uh, when we just take a look at what the president has done, we've seen the FX unification statement or effort. Uh, we've seen, of course, the subsidy removal, which is the biggest one, where and uh, the change in price of petrol affecting transportation, uh, awaiting palliative. 
And now even we have the issue of the school loan, you know, which is also mm. a big issue now. It's, I mean, yeah. it might be quiet now, but September is around the corner. Students will be back <laughs> at school, and then we will get that conversation up and running. So would yeah. you say that, yeah, of course, when there are policies, there's a time lag before we expect uh, the implementation to also to have the expected impact. But are we on the right track? So, I mean, it's first of all um, very important to, to establish that the Nigerian economy is currently in a very dear but very complex state. So there is virtually no policy you're going to take right now or execute on right now that doesn't have its downsides or doesn't have a trade-off. And these are part of the effects of having that long-term fiscal indiscipline we've had in the Nigerian economy in past administration leading up until now. All right, so it's sort of, you know, trying to manage the complexities of uh, many downsides over the years. So are we on the right track? I mean, it's, it depends on who is looking at it and where you're looking at it from. So from one angle, we've seen that with the roller coaster of policies recently, it's been so much of a roller coaster that, you know, you would expect some breather in between, you know, sort of, because uh, the current administration inherited an economy that was really, really, really on the verge of collapse to start with. So um, it would be a very bad time to roll out so much much policies that will, you know, probably pressure further down on the average Nigerian. But on the flip side of things, some of the policies that have been rolled out recently um, by the new administration have been a bit positioned to restore confidence in the new administration as well as investors' confidence. So policies like uh, taking out the subsidy, policies like um, unifying the exchange and all that. However, those policies are very complex and difficult decisions to make because they have very huge um, uh, um, trade-off uh, consequences for the Nigerian people and the economy. So are we on the right track is a function of how much are we seeking to balance out? I don't know if you get what I'm trying to say. So how much are we seeking to balance out? So you want to mention palliatives here. Yeah, palliatives are fair, but they would not necessarily fix the problem at the heart of that problem or the heart of the issue. So technically what I would think of is, first of all, before you make a policy, you want to identify what are the clear-cut social intervention initiatives that can be introduced to provide a soft landing on the other end of the trade-off, which is very key. So what has happened in recent times is that you've been, having, you've been having too many policies thrown into the space, and then you're taking a cue back to look at what palliatives can be introduced. So that's technically sort of working a bit reactive on the value chain, and it, it's sort of retrogressive as well, which is why you're asking, are you on the right track? So if you have to answer it from that point of view, it's a bit retrogressive.